Everything we do has inherent risk and cybersecurity is no different. Operating a business has its risks from poor business planning to pushing out a new product and hoping it sells well. But in the realm of cybersecurity, risk is measured and cataloged in how it can cause harm to our infrastructure, devices, users, and ultimately the reputation of the business. While not an official measure of risk, we can characterize risk by a few general terms such as uh, its probability, high or low probability. It's a high likelihood of it happening or a low likelihood of it happening. And then next we have impact. What is the impact of the organization? How does that affect the organization? Is it a low impact or high impact? We could think of a low impact being something that might cause a degradation of network services, uh, but the business is still able to operate under normal circumstances. An example of high impact could be something that causes uh, a public disclosure of private data of our customers. So this would be something that would cause harm to the reputation of the business, the operational tempo of the business, loss of sales, revenue, customer satisfaction or trust in the brand. So that is something that would be considered a high impact to the organization. I've always liked this cartoon as it provides a clear visual representation of high probability, low impact, low probability, low impact, so on and so forth. We can see the stick figure trying to traverse a chasm, whether that be uh, wide and short, short and shallow, or short and deep with a with a high yield of risk, or at the end, something that can't be traversed and most likely going to lead to that person dying, which is a little bit dramatic for cybersecurity, but there is instances where a lapse in cybersecurity can cause a loss of life in critical infrastructure, the health industry. So cyber risk is real, and it's something that we all need to be aware of. Because no matter if you are on the front line of security, uh, a junior analyst responding to incidents in the SOC, all of those events relate to the risk of the organization. And an inaccurate assessment of risk puts the whole organization at risk and everybody's jobs that are aligned with that process. There are many ways to calculate risk. They all use some similar variables, such as the likelihood of an attack, the impact of that attack, what impact will it have on the organization, or making or an accounting for the threat, what type of threat, times the vulnerability, times the likelihood. The issue with likelihood is that it is too speculative we have to go into a process of making a best guess effort as to what is the likelihood of this attack. A more appropriate approach would be looking at the consequence. What is the effect of this type of risk to our business? What would it cost? What would it harm? How would our brand look? Who would get laid off? What type of products would we have to stop selling? How would it affect our supply chain? All of those things are easier to understand on a decision making process, but they are harder to calculate. However, they do provide a more accurate assessment of risk when used. To accurately create a risk model, we need to understand the variables. A vulnerability is a weakness that is exploited by a threat actor or just simply a threat. A vulnerability can be a flaw in a system. It's misconfigured. It wasn't set up appropriately or left in default configuration. An exploit might take advantage of a piece of software. All of these things are vulnerable vulnerabilities that are present in a certain state of being. What is the current vulnerability state of our infrastructure, devices, software, and even people? How vulnerable are the people in the organization? Have they been trained on social engineering awareness? If they haven't, they're now vulnerable to those types of attacks. A threat is the possibility of a malicious attempt to damage or disrupt a computer network or system, but we can think of threats also as the source or who's going to cause a threat. There's sort of two parts to this. We have a threat source and a threat vector. Who is doing it and how are they doing it? A threat actor can be organized crime, a nation state, or a lone wolf hacker. And the vector or threat vector they use could be social engineering, 
and exploit any other method that may exist that's available to them based on the vulnerabilities present in the current organization, whether they are known or unknown. An impact can be calculated as a measure of the impact based upon business criticality. So if we know that an asset is critical to our business operations, it's hard to calculate what is the likelihood it will be attacked, although we could say it's probably higher than a redundant or menial system that really has no value to the organization, but it's still challenging to assess or put some kind of quantifier on the likelihood of impact to that asset. However, we can look at consequence. If that system goes down, we can't process payment card transactions. And over the last six months, we've trans we've processed roughly $100,000 a day in payment cards through that system. So if that system was attacked, we now know it would cost $100,000 a day would be the consequence to our network or our organization. So very quickly, we could start to assess the risk under terms that executives and business leaders really start to understand, and that's dollars. Getting cyber to talk in dollars is very, very powerful because it makes a lot of things move in the right direction. When we talk about cyber as it relates to zero days or buffer overflows and you know network traffic analysis or malicious traffic analysis and the artifacts we uncovered in that process. Executives sort of go glass-eyed on that. So being able to put something into a dollar amount, as in if this occurs, we're going to lose $500,000, so it's worth spending the $20,000 to mitigate that risk, that's something they understand. Speaking of risk mitigation, let's talk a little bit about risk management. How do we manage risk once it's been assessed? One of the first things we can do is we can simply avoid it. We do not do that business process. We do not build that application. We do not undergo that merger because the risk is too great. The cost of that risk coming to fruition outweighs the benefits or the gains from that uh, activity. So the business may choose not to conduct that activity and avoid the inherent risk uh, altogether. An organization may transfer risk. We can't accept it. We don't have the skills or means. However, we can transfer that risk on to somebody else who can take on that risk. They can manage it appropriately. Uh, this usually comes in the form of external consulting or managed security providers, uh, bringing the right folks in that have those skills to undertake that challenge. Risk transference. Risk acceptance. The business accepts the inherent risk and just carries on. I've personally seen this in the instance of a compromised server. Going back to that uh, payment card system, that processes lots of money on a daily basis. There was a system that had malware on it. It was known, it was breached, but the organization accepted the risk of that malware staying on the machine and continued to process payment card transactions because the solution to remediate that system was to bring that system down, and that was unacceptable to them. So they accepted the risk of continuing or allowing that machine to process payment cards. Last but not least, probably the most preferred, depending on business objectives, is risk mitigation, like we talked about previously. Utilizing a security control or countermeasure to manage the risk to put that risk within the acceptable boundaries of the organization. The organization knows what they're comfortable with, and if they can mitigate a risk altogether or bring the level of risk or likelihood down or the consequence of that impact to within an acceptable range, then they've mitigated that risk for the time being. Again, conducting risk assessments on a regular basis provides provides the inherent visibility that we need to monitor risk as it will change over time. So let's look at a scenario to better understand some of these risk management techniques. This one is covering risk avoidance, and the general gist here is an organization is planning on developing a new application, and it was identified that the required skills needed to secure the app as it supports and transmits private intellectual property and customer data was too great. The organization does not have the inherent skills nor budget resources to bring in the outside party needed to fix this app and get it up to where it needs to be to be within what they've deemed their compliant or secure state. So the outcome of this is that the cost to develop, maintain, and secure the app was greater than the assessed value to the organization or the benefit of that app being developed. So altogether, this organization avoided the risk and halted this product or planned application development and deployment. Here's another example. A mid-sized company is bringing on some new government contract clients and the issue being that now that they've brought on these high profile government clients, the likelihood of threats being more valid or likely posing risk to their organization made them realize that they needed to secure their organization better than they had to date. The problem is that 
the cost requirement and timeline to simply improve your network security uh, can be very costly and take a great deal of time. So this organization decided to do risk transference. They utilized an external managed service security provider or an MSSP to conduct the necessary network collection, monitoring, detection, and response activities for them. So this provides a quick turnkey solution that allows them to get the security that they need to be able to support these new customers while mitigating their risk, or I shouldn't say mitigating, lowering their risk to an acceptable means without them having to do the capital expenditure of hiring new people, buying all of their systems, doing all their contract negotiations, proof of concept, testing, and getting it all deployed and configured appropriately that could take months if not years to accomplish for a small organization and here i got a little bit ahead of myself in my narration of these slides so here's an example of risk acceptance this goes back to the organization is breached and a third party incident response firm has come on board to assess and scope this breach and during this investigation it was identified that the payment processing system is one of the compromised uh, hosts or systems within the network the organization chose to accept the risk by leaving that system online as the risk of shutting the machine down and loss of revenue was greater than the threat posed by the the breached state of that machine and malware present. Last but not least, here's an example of risk mitigation. The scenario here is an upstart e-commerce store has seen a steady rise in sales and repeat customers, and that's great. However, as the notoriety of your business grows on the internet, so does the likelihood that threat actors want to poke and prod at your web application. Because if you have more customers, you become more popular. As you become more popular, you get more customers. And that has a side effect of perceived to have a lot of money or value in that service or brand, and that makes you a lucrative target for some attackers who are looking for either financial gain or hacktivism, they want to deface your website, whatever it may be, the likelihood of attack is increasing. So this organization was concerned about these increased attacks or these, these pokes and prods that were coming from the, the great unknown as the internet. So they identified the solution being a web application firewall. This is a security software or physical hardware solution that inspects web traffic and looks for common web traffic anomalies to include known malicious activity. And a web application firewall allows you to constrict the type of allowed traffic that you would like to see visit your website. So you could think of a web application firewall as a hose and you can restrict the flow of water as to how much water and what type of water could get to your application, if that makes sense. And it ensures that you restrict and control the type of traffic that makes its way to your application. So this is an example of an organization mitigating risk by using security controls or a countermeasure that is a web application firewall to control and limit the likelihood of these types of web-based attacks and pokes and prods from causing any significant damage or harm to their business. By and large, risk management is an extremely complex process. This little blurb can't even begin to convey how challenging it is because it involves all of the stakeholders and people involved in the organization. Everybody must be involved in working in concert to assess risk. We all have to agree on what is risk within an organization. What is acceptable risk? How do we mitigate, avoid, transfer, or just accept risk? All of those things need to be predefined and determined before you can even begin to manage risk effectively. Long story short, risk management is way easier said than done, but there are processes, there are frameworks that support that, and in later video you're going to see a lot more about risk assessments and risk management. Security controls are the key method for mitigating and managing risk within an organization. If we assess that we are going to be attacked by web-based attacks, just like the previous example. We could use a web application firewall. We could use load balancers to mitigate denial of service attacks. We can do a myriad of things that are available to us if we would like to mitigate that risk, if we have an appropriate budget for those security controls. And at the end of the day, security controls, whether they are logical, physical, technological, software, whatever they may be, they usually come with a cost. Even if we have open source security controls and tools, the cost is transferred in the management of that open source project. We now need to manage it, configure it, provide our own support. There is no contract. There is no support plan that's associated with it usually. So regardless of what we do, cost is an ever looming factor. And that's what really dictates how an organization manages risk, how they accept risk.